You're listening to the Career Musician Podcast, empowering musicians with strategies for a sustainable career. This episode of The Career Musician features none other than violinist composer extraordinaire Lily Hayden. Now, whether Lily is found on stage doing a TED Talk around the globe or in the studio working on one of her own compositions, Lily is a modern-day career musician force to be reckoned with. A member of the Alliance of Women Film Composers, she has scored films including Academy Award winner Freedom Mox Anita, The House That Jack Built, and Sundance Selects Driver X. She has contributed additional scores to season two and three of the Emmy-winning series Transparent, won a Grammy for her band Opium Moon's self-titled debut record. She is also the co-composer on the new Netflix series Ginny in Georgia. Lily has also done the score for two incredible documentaries, one called Strip Down, Rise Up, and the other Ruth, Justice Ginsburg in her own words. Lily Hayden's music transcends all boundaries and brings the human spirit into fruition. Well, Lily Hayden, welcome to The Career Musician. I'm so glad you're here. This is it. (laughs) Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Super stoked. And, you know, I can't remember how we got connected, but needless to say, we have been connected and that's all that matters. Yes. So, (laughs) yeah. So typically I like to ask my guests, you know, how they got started, what inspired them, you know, when did the music bug bite you, so to speak? Uh, Well, my mom told me, used to say she was a comedian and she used to joke that I started playing violin in the womb and it was very irritating. (laughs) Um, uh, And, uh, but I had a dream I could play violin when I was seven. And my mom was a singer songwriter uh, in addition to being a stand up comedian. And I started playing with her right away. She, in fact, the day that I got my violin, she wrote a song in G major so that I could have, I could play open strings and have a sense of jamming right away. Uh, which I think, honestly, uh, if uh, I actually think I should like make it available to people so that they can, mm-hmm. so when they're getting their kids to start playing, you know, I mean, it, violin especially is just one of those instruments that takes five years to sound, you know, to actually make music. So mm-hmm. to be able to pl- have that sense of playing and camaraderie and jamming the first day uh, was a huge a huge so, profound shift, and and it really affected my desire to to jump in and chime in and and you know collaborate with people, which has basically been the basis of my of of everything I've done in in music. That's incredible, and like you say, so profound to have that initial uh, embryo of improvisation, right, born into you from the get go. That's amazing yep. because. As musicians, that's something we're always chasing after is yeah. how to get better at improvisation, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have a, a way that I've actually, especially improv- improvising as a, you know, coming from a classical background. Mm. Um, a lot of times people who have classical backgrounds uh, have a really hard time getting off the page um, because we're taught so much to focus and to, uh, and you know, like just literally you have to be like, on that note and the next phrase ahead of it and above and below it. And like, you can't like, when does the mind have time to think about, well, what if I did something else that's not written, right. you know? Uh, but I have, uh, I've developed a technique over the years, uh, special that's particularly effective for people who've come from that background. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Or is that something? I would love to. Sure. Okay. Great, great, great. Not yeah. if you ask. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, I went back to my violin teacher, uh, my Russian violin teacher, who scares the hell out of me because um, she's so in- amazing. And she was one of the principal uh, violinists of the LA Philharmonic for all these years. And um, so I went back to her to just touch up my uh, my technique because I was feeling a little bit sloppy and uh, you know like stuff was happening. I felt it was and she I went back to her and the first thing she said was slow down. Uh, Because you can't think that fast, you can't hear that fast. Um, So I slowed down, and then she said, "You're, you're like you're daydreaming. You're not focused enough. You're daydreaming." And so she said, "You got to just like focus." So I did what she said, and for the next you know couple months, I started you know like basically it was just like really rigid in that classical way, Um, and it felt good. And I and then the next time I went on stage, I clammed up. I couldn't improvise. And it was like, 
that's this is who I am. How could I not be able to improvise? And I realized it was because I was too focused. I had stopped daydreaming. And I realized that it was so important to, to, to empower that daydreaming. But if I wanted to play with the kind of the, the intonation and precision and flow and tone and, uh, you know, uh, elegance that I really wanted to have in my playing, that I had to somehow uh, meld the the classical focus with the daydreaming. So basically, I allow myself to daydream, but I apply all of those disciplined techniques of taking things really slowly, breaking down the, the hand positions, the shifting. Um, whatever it is that I am hearing in my head, I just give it the same treatment that I do if it, as if it were Bach. Um, and that allows me to then... Uh, play all of my ideas, execute them with the same fluidity and panache that I would if I were just playing classical, but it also empowers my creativity. So I call it daydreaming with discipline. And, uh, I, and I think it's a, it's a good way for uh, people. And then just to get to the idea phase, I, am, I, uh, I encourage people to listen to music that is improv improvisatory, but also has a lot of space in it. And I don't think this Anybody who does that better than this amazing uh, Armenian duduk player named Jivan Gasparian. Oh. Um, if you're not hip to him, he is unbelievable. And it's spelled G-A-S-P-A-R-I-A-N. And he plays, uh, it's basically like, a, it's a reed instrument. It's called duduk, D-U-D-U-K. Um, and, uh, and he plays these incredible lines with a lot of space uh, in there against a drone and any, and you could basically listen to it. And then even if your ears aren't, you know, if your ear training isn't like lightning fast, there's enough space for you to basically hear what he does, mm. play it back to him and then, you know, keep going. And, and then it encourages our own ideas. What was his first name? Jivan, D-J-I-V-A-N, Jivan Gasparian. Okay, got it. So, so I love this daydreaming discipline, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but there's a lot of things to unpack here. First, the first thing I want to say, I love how you hit it right on the head. A lot of what they used to refer to as legit players, right? Classically trained players. I don't know. Is that term thrown around anymore? Legitimate players, legit, is, or is that? Uh, I, it's. I don't think it's thrown around, but I think it's implied. Okay. It's still the subtext. It's like, right, yeah, right. but can she really play? Right. You know? <laughs> right. Because growing up, I studied some classical and 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 flamenco and things of that nature as well, and. I would always find myself in the same position. I'm in the practice room working on a Bach prelude or a series of, you know, finger exercises and whatnot. And then I start improvising and writing a piece. And yeah. I had two teachers that frowned on that. They said, what are you doing? You, you can't do that. You have to pay attention and exactly what you're talking about. And yeah. then I let go of that. And I said, you know what? Screw that. I got to be me. That's exactly. I'm, right. But the, that's, but the thing is that especially for violin, you really like, you know, the classical technique mm -hmm. is, look, it's not the only technique. There's plenty of, you know, Cajun, there's blues, there's, da -da, you know, whatever, uh, whatever that is. Um, but, uh, but I think that, sorry, I just got another, um, uh, but, uh, I think for violin, the technique really, mm -hmm. It, classical technique is really the sound that my that I really like. So it you, you re, I didn't want to have to choose between my technique, my class, my sound, and my voice. Right. Well, listening to your music, which is very beautiful, by the way, I've been checking all your stuff out online. Uh, Thank you. Absolutely. With from your band with Opium Moon to all your your solo stuff and your scores, I love your knack for you know, m melodic development, okay, and keeping, and some of the pieces you have a very pop Beatlesque vibe in there, and then some of them, they're very much more modal, and, you know, I yeah. love how you take a modal concept and you just expound on it. You take that mode, you turn it every which way, you know, oh, I, I love that. Yeah, yeah, and, and you're, no. classical players don't normally have that kind of broad vernacular, right? Well, well, mostly because we're told not to, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, focus, don't, don't, you know, right. I remember my violin teacher saying to me, you know, I don't know what you think you're playing, but it's not Bach. <laughs> <laughs> 
That reminds me of the the scene from Crossroads. Do you remember that movie Crossroads with Ralph no. Macchio and Steve I? Anyway, he was studying classical guitar and he said the same thing. He played a Mozart piece and at the end he put a little blues cadence on it and basically uh -huh. the teacher ripped him a new one. You know, it was like right, uh -huh. it was the end of the world, you know? <laughs> right, right. Uh, well, uh, in term, it, as you say, the modal stuff is really, uh, it's one of the things that I love the most and what I love so much is, and actually, so I got to, I got to, uh, be a part of Herbie Hancock's band, uh, for, uh, for a little while. And, um, and every time he would play certain things, it was like, Oh my God, you're ripping my, my head is exploding. What are you doing? Yeah. And he said, Oh, it's just the diminished scale. It's just the whole step, half step diminished scale. And then if you play that against a drone, you basically have it's like a magic incantation. <laughs> it's amazing if you actually stick with it. And so I just love that you've got like in that one scale. And of course, so many of the different, you know, you, you just pick a scale, anything you do with the intention to make it sort of like an incantation mm. is going to have a kind of sacred power to it. But especially that uh, it's this kind of this modal thing. And that you've got the major, the minor, the, the, the augmented, the, the, you know, the diminished, but like, you just got it all in there. And it's, it's, I love playing with that because to me, that's the, how, how music mirrors life. Cause life is not, you're never just happy or sad. It's always a mixed bag, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, so, so that, I, that's one of the things that I love about this is that's the music that kind of tells me, okay, this is a person who's paying attention to what life really is. Yeah, that's amazing because as they say in nature, there's no straight lines, right? So right, no. it's, it's a very similar concept. Okay, uh, this is beautiful. I love this. And I love how you use the term incantation. That's great. Uh, great encapsulation of that whole concept. Um, let, let's rewind a little bit. So now we know the inspiration. Where are you from originally? Where, where are your origins and, you know, both uh, culturally and also geographically? Uh, so I grew up in LA. I'm originally from Canada, Toronto, but I grew up in LA. My mom and dad were both in the business, um, both sort of the, the black sheep of their families. Uh, my mom was a stand up comedian and a, and a, you know, her name was Lotus Weinstock. She was the first woman to perform at the comedy store wow. and uh, engaged to Lenny Bruce the last year of his life. And my dad was, uh, was, uh, also a beautiful musician, um, but he was a conspiracy theorist and a sort of an underground um, director. Uh, and uh, he, you know, kind of created also the first person to mass produce LSD and turn the world onto God, as he put it, um, <laughs> uh, alongside Owsley Stanley. So pretty trippy. Uh, I, uh, both of them have sadly passed away but uh but i grew up in la um started acting which uh was was always really fun but music was always my passion and uh so to sort of so film composing has mm -hmm. been in a way the perfect combination of perfect confluence of both of those uh kind of you know creative expressions so uh because you know you uh, i relate i think what what you know i think there's no rule for how people, uh, you know, film composers approach different projects, different ways. Uh, there are really no rules, but I think one of the things that gives me my particular point of view is that I'm relating the characters dramatically as opposed to intellectually and musically specifically. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to know, you know, like how, if a person, it, you know, has a little glint in their eye, I don't want to step on that, you know, like, and, and, uh, and I want to support it. And, and I used to work with Hans Zimmer a lot um, as part of his uh, his team, and sometimes I still do. Uh, and I asked Hans if you know if there was one kind of nutshell gift he could give me for like what what's the best you know what what treasure can you give me? What advice can you give yeah. me? Um, he said, "Fall in love with your star." So uh, essentially, you know, basically just make them the most important thing in the universe um, with your music. And so I, I think I do that in a way as, uh, you know, with my background acting and also as a person who's played with a million uh, artists, uh, you know, a, a, apart from doing my own solo records, I've also uh, supported a bunch of uh, amazing artists and um, uh, including 
you know, Roger Waters and, uh, Sting and Seal and, uh, and of course Herbie. Um, but, uh, and so I just think of dialogue as the lead singer. Mm, I love that. Great. Another great encapsulation. Dialogue is the lead singer. Okay. So you've, you've laid down some, some awesome facts here. Let's, let's rewind a smidge because, um, it's really important that I break down how our guests go from being an, an inspired uh, musician to successfully being a working musician. So mm -hmm. now we know your, your roots, where, you, where it all comes from, and we know where your accomplishments, which are beautiful, by the way. Uh, I think it might have been Ginny in Georgia that I first saw your name because my wife and I loved that show. And oh, then I, just, I started paying attention. I'm like, wait a minute. Oh, she's on everything. So I, I love it. I've, I've seen you everywhere. I've heard you everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Um, so let's talk about how you went from, you know, this creative being as a musician to actually getting the gigs, actually getting the jobs. As we say, how did you cut your teeth? How did you first get started? You know, that's a, that's a gap that a lot of listeners need to hear. Right. Well, um, you know, uh, I guess, you know, I'm, I've been around a while, so I've been, you know, doing this for 20 years. Um, and then when I first started, there were a lot more jams around town. Mm. Um, I used to, you know, basically what I would do is I'd, I'd open the LA Weekly and I'd find out where the open mics and the jams were. And there were always jams every, there was, you know, there were different, uh, I would just go from, I'd figure out where the live gigs were and I would go with my violin and I'd start with the jams. And if I didn't have my own gig, I would go to other people's gigs and I would walk up to the stage with my violin and I'd say, can I play? Can I jump in? Oh, can I sit in? And sometimes people would let me. And when they did, I had, I had good ears and I was ready to, you know, I just wanted to collaborate as much as possible. And those jams were amazing because I got to play with, um, like phenomenal musicians and, and, and that's where I found all the members of my early bands. Mm -hmm. Um, was like i you know i remember playing with this drummer i'm like oh my god i love your energy we have to i i have a gig play with me you know yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like and every time i'd play with somebody else's band i would steal half their band <laughs> i think i had a bad reputation for doing that uh but you know it was like fair game i was uh you know i'm a musician i love to like musicians are musicians we want to play with everybody you know so uh yeah. so essentially i just started isn't going around and um, saying yes to everything. And I, I'd say 90% of my gigs were freebies because mm -hmm. I just wanted to be there when the shit was happening, mm -hmm. you know, and as soon as people have money, they'll pay you mm -hmm. if you ask for, you know what I mean? It's like, but if you, until you make yourself indispensable, you know, like I got, I've gotten so many gigs just because I was the one up at, you know, three in the morning and, you know, people knew I was, I would just, you know, I, I always said yes. And you show up, you just there. I show yep. up. Yep. Yeah. That's my, I mean, that's the biggest thing is, and, and that has been obviously that, you know, majorly curtailed over the last year. Mm -hmm. uh, but even before that, a lot of the jams dried up, but mm -hmm. you know what? A and also part of that is that rather than, you know, having live music, a lot of venues, changed to electronic music, which mm -hmm. obviously is not as interactive. Um, I don't know. I guess I think I, I start with just saying yes, making your going to places where there are people that you'd like to collaborate with, okay. you know, whether that's other people's gigs, uh, film festivals. I don't know. Uh, is your demographic mostly musicians or is there like a film composer component? I, I think there's definitely, it's broad. I think there's the, the composer component as well. I try to keep all the guests nice and varied. So myself, I'm a musician and a composer and producer. So, you know, again, it's the whole thing, right? You know, it takes a lot yeah, of yeah. Different elements to make up the whole of our career, so to speak. Yeah. And that's, and that's actually the other thing that I was going to say is like diversifying in a way, you know, I, I think, all right. So the other thing is that when people ask me, you know, what's like, I, I'm just starting out. What's your advice? My first, the first thing I say is, is there anything else in the world that would make you happy? Mm. And if there's 
anything else in the world that would make you happy, do that. And do this as a side thing, because this is the, the ups and downs are nuts, you know, as you know. Um, but if there's nothing else that makes you happy, <laughs> then give every last drop you yeah, have of blood and just let everybody that you know and your spouse and your family and your friends know that they're going to be second playing second fiddle no fun, pun intended ha, you know? i love uh, it. they will just nothing will come before your music and my husband and i are both musicians and we both know that sometimes he is like you know, can you come to me before three in the morning? Um, you know, because this is getting a little bit, you know, like, it's like, hey, I got a gig. Yeah. You know, I got to get it finished. Wow. I've I got it, you know, and, and he's pretty cool. I try to, uh, but essentially it's like give everything you have and say yes to everything, even if it's, you know, you it's like, and there's probably, see, before you start demanding, you know, like that you be paid and get your publishing and all the other stuff, mm -hmm. just know that you're going to get taken advantage of. And that's just the nature of the business. And you got to be comfortable with that. And my mom used to say, the only thing that's fair is between you and the creation. So just give it your heart, know that it's feeding you. And there's going to be a point at which you say, okay, well, you know, everybody else is getting paid. I think I got to get paid also. Right. Uh, you know, it's my band. So yeah, I'm willing to, you know, like if I only have $500 and right. you know, that means I, that 500 goes to my band and I don't make anything. It's know that it's, it's your, it's my name on it. So I'm the one, you know, that's how I'm getting paid is because I'm my, it's my exposure, yeah, it's you know, and there's going to be a point at which that doesn't feel good. And then you start and then you make your boundaries based on, you know, uh, but, but the first for me, it's about saying yes and showing up and, and every, I, every good thing that I have ever done, I could draw you a, 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 a line from, you know, it, it would be a, a serpentine line, mm -hmm. but to something I did for free. Yeah, that's right. Wow. I love that. The common thread when I ask that question is yes. You know, yeah. always say yes, always show up. Now, I love the tenacity that you have. I, I did the same. I did a very similar thing when I first arrived in L.A. And back in 2005, I moved here from Nashville. But I, I was originally from New York. But anyway, I got here in 2005 and everybody said go to Cafe Cordiel. So that was my first stop. And then it was uh, Lave Lee was still around. Yeah. yeah. And there was a, like you said, there was a couple clubs in town that you can go to jam sessions. I think there's a few coming back now uh, after COVID. Uh, but you're right. The landscape has changed. Yeah. Uh, I see a lot of what's happening now. They call duets on TikTok and Instagram. Have yeah. You seen that? Yeah. You know, I keep meaning to do it. I've got a couple of people that I want to do my duets with. Right. Um, That's and I'm, I'm going to do it. I yeah. just have to, you know, like wrap my head around it. Right. But yes. That's. Yeah. Look, if that's what it takes, and you know, go get your duets, you know? That's right. That's right. Totally. Whatever it takes. You know, just the, I think the best advice is that um, just do something for your career every day. Mm -hmm. do so, just one thing, even if it's just 15 minutes, if it's, you know, listening to somebody else, reaching out to them and saying, you know, how can I be helpful? Mm -hmm. You know, what can I do to make, you know, to, to be helpful? That's right. That's right. Um, and somebody will say yes, you know, and they'll let you be an intern in their place or they'll, you know, you just, I, I've been a part of so many people's scenes and most of, in fact, my early, you know, I've, I've, I was lucky enough to open for Jimmy Page and Robert Plant uh, on their last U.S. tour. I was lucky enough to open for, uh, Parliament Funkadelic. I uh, I opened for Sting. I opened for um, who else? Uh, you know, a bunch of cool bands. And uh, and I also played with all of those people. And part of the way that I got those gigs is that people asked me to play with them. And I said, mm. yes, but could I also open? That's so you know? smart. So smart. And, uh, and sometimes it was like, fuck that. You know, like, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but you could say uh, I, I was, uh, in fact, Leonard Cohen asked me to, to play with him 
uh, on his last tour. Yeah. And I said, and I had a, my own record coming out at the same time. And I, this was an example where I couldn't say, I couldn't just say yes without asking if I could also open. Yeah. So I asked him if I could open for him and he said he'd love to, but his girlfriend and his son would kill him because <laughs> they were both, uh, uh, they were both solo artists that wanted that spot. So he said he couldn't do that. And I had to turn that tour down and I wish that I had done it. I mean, I, yeah. I didn't know it would be his last. I probably could have guessed knowing his age and stuff, but, um, yeah. But I had just, uh, I had just released my, my own record was coming out at the same time. Uh, anyway, all of that to say, so, I, I, but I wouldn't have gotten any of those gigs had I not said yes to, to playing with. I love that. And I love the tenacity once again. Now, again, if I could draw a parallel, and this is a great lesson to everybody listening and myself included, I was the music director for Babyface for 10 years, right? Wow. But, and I, I knew I was my own artist too. But I didn't have the wherewithal yet when I got the gig or the foresight to say, sure, I'll do it if I can open for you. Like that didn't even dawn on me. And then years later, I was saying to myself, damn, I wish I would have said, can I open for you? And at that point, when I came back to management, they were like, no. And what was so interesting is for a while when I first joined the band, he, he had... A, a guy artist opening that was very similar to what I did. So that's, that is such great advice. And please, everybody listening, take Lily's advice on that. <laughs> now it's not always going to work. It doesn't, it, 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 a lot of times it doesn't work, but right. it works sometimes. And you know, uh, and it doesn't have to be like a hard line, like I'll do it right. if I can. Right. It's like, you know, yeah, just hang out. you be part of it. You make yourself indispensable. Yep. And then you say, Hey, by the way, you know, I'm a solo artist Would you know, check out this tune make. And then also what I would say is, uh, a lot of what I, uh, I'm learning how to be more efficient in my communication in terms of like, you know, here's one song. Don't expect people to listen to your whole album. They probably won't, you know, and it's but even better if it's just a link, they don't have to download anything. Right. You know, the less you have you, work you make people do, the better. Um, and then that, the same thing has worked for me uh, with scoring as well. I mean, not completely, but, you know, just like saying, you know, you hear somebody's on a show and you, you know, like we all have actor friends, you know, in LA and like, oh, you got a show. That's awesome. Do they have a composer? You know, that's it. they might, they might not, that's you right. know, and, uh, and even if you're just hang, you know, just hanging out right. with, uh, you know, and just making yourself. And and I've also gone too far the that you know the other way. I mean, I've always, always gone too far with pushing myself, you know, where I've like said, you know, hey, can I, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, people were, you know, got it was like back off. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've 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 heard back off, you know, I've I, <laughs> many times. Uh, and then you do, as long as you're, look, the, the main thing is treating people like human beings and being cool with, you know, like just being, learning how to read signs, you know, knowing if it's like just being elegant and graceful, you know, be in the room, say yes, be, you know, it's a, just a delicate balance of knowing when to push and retreat. I don't know. There's no, there's no rule. You just have to feel it, but but I think a lot of times people, especially women, err on the side of being polite. And uh, that was never my pop problem. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. You sound like a New Yorker. I'm, I'm, not, I'm that way by, by nature because I'm just this hot-headed right. Latin Italian New Yorker. So, <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> but I love the fact that you're from L.A. too. You're an anomaly, by the way. You know? Yeah. Uh, you know, a native, just like my wife. She's from here as well. So that's cool. But uh, yes, it's so true. You have to feel it. Okay, so I, I love all this information. This is fantastic. Let's take all of this now and and tell us about a day in the life of Lily Hayden. So well, I read somewhere that you were still practicing several hours a day and, and still uh -huh. honing your craft, and and I love that. And I know you're working on lots of projects. So what's a day in the life for you? Uh, well, um, it's every day is different, truly. Uh, but I do have to find time to practice because violin and voice don't really wait for, you know, like it, if you go too long, it can be a nightmare. So 
Yeah. Yesterday, I couldn't practice, so uh, I just was too tired at the end of the day. I also don't sleep much. Uh, I tend to be an all-nighter kind of person. I love those hours. Yeah. But last night, I decided... Oh, I, sorry. Let me... Um, uh, are we there? Do I still have... I, I can hear uh, Sorry, I was getting another call. Uh, no, so uh, last night, I decided... All right, well, my golden hours are really like three and four in the morning. Mm. So I decided, okay, I'm going to go to bed at 10 and wake up at four. So I woke up at four, (laughs) uh, played with my kitten for an hour. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And then I practiced for a couple of hours and I'm now working on a, a, um, working on music for season two of Janan, Georgia. No. I'm pitching on a new project, which I fingers crossed would be phenomenal. Just think good thoughts for me, please. Yep. Uh, Everything. Um, my band Opium Moon uh, is with my husband and two other amazing musicians, um, uh, Hamid Saidi on Persian Hammer Dulcimer, which is called the Hassan Tour, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, MB Gordy, who you may know um, uh, on percussion, brilliant percussionist um and my husband is itai disraeli brilliant bass player um and we are doing our follow-up album to our grammy winning first album which uh uh which is still the best music to um make love to uh if you if you're if if you have a date night or even a meditation night uh check it out um i like and uh and our follow-up album actually we are we have all this stuff that's kind of the, the chill out, sensual, beautiful stuff. But we also love to make people dance and groove. So we decided to make put them on two different records and uh, make a double album. So it's called Opium Moon Day and Night. Nice. Um, and uh, so that that's coming out. We're just refining the the last, you know, the, the timing between tracks and the last little details of the credits and this and that. Uh, so uh, I'm basically in charge of doing that and uh, that'll be coming out august 6th um and uh, a couple of my projects that i scored this last year that came out um uh, Ginny and georgia and also a documentary for netflix called strip down rise up yep. is uh, they're both an emmy consideration so if anybody uh who's listening is a, an emmy voter uh or even a, a recording academy voter um please uh, be grateful for your consideration. Anyway, so I'm basically doing yeah. that kind of promoting. And um, and uh, and also, I made a music video for one of the tracks on this latest solo album that came out a couple months ago. Um, and the remix actually uh, was done by Carmen Rizzo, who you may know, um, and it's just getting added to radio now. Um, and, um, and I made a music video with a friend of mine who's a wonderful filmmaker, and we're actually going to, it turned into this kind of an experimental short film, sort of inspired by Wings of Desire, uh, you know, that classic Ben Vendor's film, and uh, we're going to be submitting it to film festivals. So, uh, so we're just refining the edit on that and figuring out which festivals to submit it to, and uh and then uh, at five o'clock, I've got a, a, a mixer for the recording academy. And then uh, I've got a, you know, it's yeah. like, and then I'm back to work. I love it. I love it. That is awesome. Okay. Now, recently you got COVID. Is that right? Yeah, actually. Um, was- it, was, uh, it was actually a year ago, uh, right about now, which is coming up to my year anniversary of COVID. Uh, yeah, I had a couple nights where I really understood that this was not a normal flu. Mm. <laughs> this was this was not just the flu. This right. was a fucking vice grip, you know, a steel contraption around your ribs, like some kind of, you know, like uh, you know, uh, barbaric, you know, Edwardian English torture uh, right. <laughs> uh, that. Uh, you know, the, the, basically you couldn't, I couldn't breathe. Um, and that gave me the courage to, uh, release the song more love, which became the title track on the album that just came out. Um, uh, which is simply saying life is a miracle. And, you know, with that love, with that only love is the, actually that there's no issue in the world for which more love 
and understanding is not the answer. And there's actually a scientific basis for that statement. And I'll tell you what that is, if you'd like. Absolutely. Um, uh, That is basically uh, that the brain has all these different, you know, uh, like, you know, regions that are responsible for different functioning. Well, the amygdala, the lizard brain, the fight or flight brain is, uh, you know, the basically when fear is activated, where your basic human needs aren't being met. The amygdala is activated. And when it is activated, it literally steals the energy from the rest of your brain so that your the rest of your brain isn't functioning as well, the, including uh, empathy, including the nuances of love, including um, your powers of discernment. Um, so we, so uh, confrontation with people who are who are afraid, who are acting from fear, mm-hmm. only compounds the amygdala's stranglehold on the rest of the brain. So there's really no reasoning with somebody who's afraid. You know, only making them feel comfortable and safe is uh, and loved is going to actually penetrate that 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 kind of feedback loop of fear and the behavior that comes with it. So that's why I say only love is capable of really, uh, of fixing the problems that we have going now. So uh, I, uh, all of that was, uh, came out of COVID. <laughs> hey, this is Lily Hayden and you're listening to The Career Musician with Nomad. The goal of the Career Musician Podcast is to provide valuable insight aimed at supporting working musicians. Please show your support by listening, downloading, subscribing, sharing, liking, and leaving a review. Learning the secrets of the industry from the veterans who know it best. Be sure to subscribe to the Career Musician Podcast. Wow, that's powerful knowledge and to have that firsthand experience. Yeah. and I think it's, I mean, you know, that message aligns perfectly with, with, with what we do as musicians, right? I mean, yeah. artists, this is our purpose. I, I feel strongly about that. It's our purpose to spread joy and, and, and good vibes throughout the world by what we do, you know, whether it's this really problem medicine. happens that, Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that is awesome. Okay, now something else you're no stranger to are TED Talks. Yes. Now, that's something I aspire to myself. I really want to do a TED Talk for the career musician and and you know teaching uh general the general public about how the fact that being a, a professional musician actually is a career, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so tell us about that. That's really cool that you've done a TED Talk or or two or several, right? Uh actually, I um Opium Moon just did uh, one right before the shutdown, we performed with Ted India. Um, but, uh, before that I had done four of them on my own. Wow. Um, one of them was for the big Ted stage and the other three were for TEDx's, yeah. um, which are pretty, uh, pretty, uh, there, I mean, there are a lot of TEDx talks. So, so I bet, you know, next time I'm approached, um, or, you know, next time I hear of one, I'd be delighted to connect you to the people that are putting them on, you know, I'm, uh, who knows what, what their topic will be, you know, if it, if it makes sense, but, uh, I'm, I love making connections to people. So, uh, with people. So I'd be happy to, to hook you up if you, if that works out. Um, but I basically was just asked, you know, to, uh, just from years of performing, people ask me to, to do that. And it's really been just like, you know, tenacity, just being in the right place at the right time. People saying, Hey, why don't you, or, you know, Hey, can I, uh, and, uh, and, uh, I, I love to share ideas. So it's a, the perfect, it's a perfect forum actually. Right. What are some of the talk topics that you've covered? Uh, so one of them was, uh, how so the the last one that we did for opium moon was how music is actually the way we make music uh is actually a blueprint for how to make peace because when we're playing we uh we're listening to each other when we're playing we're making space for each other we have to respect each other's point of view what we you know if you have to listen and really have no ego if you want to have a good jam 
You know, if you're just there to get your ideas across, you're not you're going to play all over anybody else, and that's going to be a sucky jam. You know, it's going it, it doesn't yield the best music. Um, the way we respect each other's cultures, the way we uh, we realize, we recognize that together we're making something bigger and more imaginative and more powerful than anything we would do, and diff- at least different than anything we would do on our own. Right. Um, and so all of those are really the necessary components in conflict resolution and making peace. So uh, especially with a band like Opium Moon, which is made up of uh, uh, you, you know musicians from Iran, Israel, United States, and Canada, um, we you know these are countries that are supposed to be enemies, you know, uh, but we make peace through a harmony. Uh, so especially with these cultural differences, we really felt like. Uh, our particular way of making music was a great way to sort of a great metaphor for how to make peace. Uh, so that's one of them. Uh, I had uh, an accident in my home uh, about 10 years ago where uh, pesticides that were in the foundation of the house actually were released into the heating and air conditioning system and contaminated everything I owned. And I had to actually get rid of my belongings and evacuate and I had brain damage from it what? and I was able to recover fully thank God because of music and so there's one TED talk how on how music saved my brain and that's another way another place where I learned about the different regions of the brain being responsible for different parts and how when you play music you're actually activating your brain uh, in a way that no other discipline does. And it actually creates neuroplasticity above and beyond any other discipline and uh, uh, brain regeneration uh, in a way that they didn't think was possible before. So if you ever know anybody who's had any kind of brain damage or stroke or anything like that, the best thing they can do is play music. Even if they're not musicians, five minutes a day actually causes new synapses to fire and it and it is an it causes improvement in every other area uh that the brain functions in so so that was one of my ted talks and then there was another one that i did for ted women where i talked about how sexism is actually based on power not sex and uh and how that actually relates it to every other issue that we confront uh, which is basically power, the domination principle. One person dominating, exerting their will over another person. Uh, and, uh, and that is really the core issue with sexism, racism, um, uh, perpetual war, mm-hmm. uh, economic disparity, mm-hmm. animal cruelty, mm-hmm. environmental destruction. You name it, it's all about domination and the lack of respect for one individual uh, over another. And so my, uh, I basically looked at the civil rights movement and the word and the signs, the iconic signs that the, that the uh, sanitation workers wore when they marched with Martin Luther King before he was killed. I am a man. And I re- and to me, those four words just absolutely distill the essence of what every movement is saying, which is, I deserve respect. I will be counted. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I wrote a song called I Am a Man that I always wanted to perform with a multicultural choir. So when they asked me to perform for TED Women, I said, I want to do a song called I Am a Man with, uh, with people, with men and women and old and young and every color and every gender and people with disabilities and every every group should be represented in this choir. And so we were able to assemble a 30-piece choir with, you know, basically pretty much every every demographic, every pronoun represented. That's and it was very powerful. Uh, so and I did one on uh, as well, uh, two more on top of that, but uh, I, I think I've gone on and long enough. That's beautiful. You can, you can find them all on my website. 
I was just going to say, yeah, we definitely we're going to shout out your, your all your handles. LilyHayden.com on uh, Instagram is just l- at Lily Hayden. Uh, Hayden, a, uh, H-A-Y-D-N. And Lily yeah. is L-I-L-I. So, yeah, and there's no way between the D and the N. It's a little, a right. little weird. Exactly. No, that's cool. That's cool. I love it. So it's so funny you read my mind because I was going to ask you, first of all, you are like the unicorn composer because let's face it, composing for film and TV has been mainly male dominated for, come on, decades now. And it's so cool that we are starting to see more and more uh, female uh, and all gender composers coming up in the game. And yeah. you are one of those leading mavericks. So, and I noticed you're also a member of the Alliance uh, for Women Film Composers. So yeah. Yeah, that's something that's incredible. And you also served under Hans Zimmer. So, wow, talking about this huge dichotomy because Hans is like the man, quote unquote, pun intended yeah. for composers, yeah. right? And, yeah. and as a female composer who, like you say, like I said, you're blazing your own trail. Talk about that. that that's incredible. So kudos well, to you, first of all. Well, thank you so much. Um, you know, uh, what we've, realized in the Alliance for Women Film Composers, which has really been just, you know, so amazing for the advocacy and really was started by Laura Cartman and uh, a couple of other uh, amazing women film composers, Lolita Ritmanis um, and Miriam Cutler. Um, uh, they were really mavericks. Um, so I've been, you know, what we, we all talked about when we first got together was, you know, we're all used to being the only woman in the room. We're mm-hmm. all, we were all kind of comfortable, like uncomfortable, comfortable being the exception to the rule. Like, you know, like, okay, well, I'll be the one, the exception, you know, mm-hmm. but we realized that there was just, there was a ceiling where we weren't being considered for certain gigs and seeing less experienced men getting shots that would have like, like, Great. why did he get that? Right. Why did he get off, like, the opportunity to do that? He's not more, you know, he's, I'm more established than that guy. So That's why, you know, and we realized that there was, we weren't going to be able to get the playing field level until we had a certain critical mass. And they've done social science studies, you know, anthropological studies of, like, you know, when marginalized, you know, when, when minority groups, you know, don't achieve any kind of <clears throat> parity or, or fairness until they reach about a 25% uh, critical mass. So we're still, we went from 1% to, I think we're now at about 5% of all the studio projects. Um, so that's 500% improvement, yeah. but it's still 20% less than it needs to be. So what we realized was that rather than being comfortable with being the exception to the rule and the, you know, and the only one in the room, the only woman in the room, we had to basically like support each other and realize that each of our, you know, that, that my sister's uh, accomplishment is actually helping me as well. Mm -hmm. You know, that, uh, and Hans has been very supportive of women. Uh, You know, I think more so now that, so much, you know, we're, we're making, we're, beca- we're, we're making more noise, um, pun intended. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, you, we're starting to see more women, but we've always been there. Yeah. Uh, and it, now it's just, you know, we're getting, uh, we're, we're being invited into the room a little bit more, which means that then we can kick ass more. <laughs> You know, That's but right. we've, we've been there, you know, it's, yeah. and I'm one of many amazing, I mean, I, I, I'm so impressed with the, I, I, and none of us ever really thought of ourselves as like women composers. We're just composers. We just happened to run up against the fact, you know, this kind of this, this, uh, implicit bias that, uh, that when you hire your film composer, it's going to be a man. Mm-hmm. Eve and what was really, what, what I hope we're starting to be successful in doing and I think that must be the case or we wouldn't be in, you know, sh- we wouldn't be having the success that, you know, the, 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 the moment of uh, clarity that we're having um, is that even women directors, women producers and women executives were hiring men over women when, and not even giving women the chance to pitch. Wow. Um, so now that we're like, that to me was like the most egregious 
oversight. But now we're starting to, I think people are starting to just realize that we, that representation matters and we've, you got to be more inclusive and, you know, and so, and now people are starting to say, well, yeah, we, we'd like a woman composer on this, you know, and great. So I don't mind playing the woman card. I've been, you know, left out of it because of that, you know, yeah. Uh, I, I think probably Ginny and Georgia, uh, I wouldn't have been invited into the room where I, you know, if I weren't a woman. And I think that what that my perspective as a woman brings something to it. Brings, that, like you said, those characters to life. Yeah. The, the, like Hans told you to fall in love with your lead. That's really important. Yeah. And to have an understanding of a female perspective in a show like that is super important, right? It's, it's yeah. Pretty- you know, and I can't even particularly uh, s- say what like why my uh why my perspective is different than a man's mm. but i think that i tend to lean into the emotion of a scene mm. and a and a given project more than uh than my than a lot of the people that i work with you know and of course and it's like the style of filmmaking and film composing now is you know a lot of film i've worked with a lot of filmmakers who don't want to like don't want to lean on melody too much because they're afraid it'll be too manipulative. Like, I I want it to be fun. I want it to be, I don't want to make, I don't want to tell people how to feel, you know? Um, And I'm all about subtlety and, you know, space and being hip and all that stuff. But (laughs) I think, you know, if you, if you're not, if you leave people without an emotional payoff at the end of your film, you're missing out on half the experience. So I've been known to push directors and like argue with directors in a way that some film composers, you know, like a, a reg, like a, a, a film composer who isn't also a, a, a diva, <laughs> who isn't also a solo artist um, might not have the, the courage to do, but, I feel like, and I just scored a, a documentary, a feature documentary called Ruth, uh, J- Justice Ruth, Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg in her own words, uh, that's on Stars and Amazon Prime and uh, all the video on demand stuff. It's uh, it'll be in uh, Emmy consideration next year. Um, but uh, and the in the tenth music they had uh, like a cool rock song at the end of it, which was like, oh, Ruth is so happening, and it's like, yeah, this is fun and hip. And I just told the director, like, you're, <laughs> this film is so emotionally driven and so powerful. If you don't let me at least try to mm-hmm. beat the temp with something that's emotional, that's like the, the, the realization of my theme, my Ruth theme, um, at the end, I think we're going to be missing out on a more powerful film. Mm-hmm. And she said, all right, well, I love this, but try to beat it. And yeah. I did something that I thought that we both agreed was, was more powerful than the temp. And, uh, and at the end of the film, you know, a lot of people say they're crying at, you know, at a documentary about a justice on the Supreme court, you know, it's not, and, and that really also different helps to differentiate it from the RBG film that came before it that had some sh- success. Right. So, uh, so I feel like I don't know if that per- perspective is particularly female, but uh, it's definitely mine, and uh, and I think it probably is more of a female perspective than than a male. Yeah. Well, I think it's fantastic. And also, I know if I don't ask this question, there's probably going to be some people who are going to be mad at me. How did you get connected with the Hans Zimmer camp? Because we've all heard stories. We've all heard how, you know, strict and and regimented that camp is and how difficult it can be to get in or to even stay in. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. About that Uh, before we wrap. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Well, Henry Jackman, who's a brilliant composer as well. Um. Uh, is a friend of mine. I worked with him because I was uh, I played with Seal and I was recording for Seal. And Henry was uh, had started out as an engineer for him and then ended up doing some production with him. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I ended up meeting Henry through Seal. And Henry and I just stayed in touch. Henry was making a solo album, and I played and sang for him on that. And then he ended up as part of Hans's camp, uh, basically ghost composing on a. a 
a ton of his films for about three years. He was one of his main additional writers. Um, and Henry invited me in to play uh, for him on uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, and that was my first film there. And Hans just liked what I did. And I brought a, um, you know, I what the film composing world, because it's so taxing and so time consuming, it can be a little bit, um, what's the word? Uh, as you said, sort of hermetically sealed and a little bit, uh, uh, it can be, it, at times it can be sterile because you're just working under such pressure, such heavy deadlines that, uh, you know, you can't afford to take a risk on somebody who may not get it right on the first take, but who might have more flavor and magic and fire than the person who gets it on the first take, mm. you know? So I've never really been the, yeah, it's not true. Uh, some of my first takes are best, but they're, I'm by no means a perfect first take person. Yeah. You know, I, I, sometimes I am, but like, I, I like to, you know, I'm, I like to be able to punch in where I, where I need to, yeah. even if the fire is in the first take, you know, I like to refine things. And so I was brought into, you know, Henry brought me in, uh, as, as somebody with fire and, uh, and, ha and Hans liked that. And so, uh, he invited me to stay. I, he's got other violinists and singers that play with him. Uh, he calls me when, when it's, just right for me when it's got to be that lily sound uh, i played and sang i do this thing where i play violin and sing at the same time and it gives it this kind of uh what the fuck sound um um and uh kind of a two-headed monster sound yes uh, and he brought me in to to uh be the one of the voices of the, the uh, evil mermaids in the last pirates of the caribbean i was so going to say it's it's so hauntingly beautiful thank, thank you, you. that up i was going to ask you about that as well yes thank you well so i'm scared i'm scaring children in perpetuity at disneyland <laughs> i love it that's perfect because there you go that is awesome it's playing at disney too look at that that is beautiful all right all right so so many wonderful little tidbits and 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 pearls of wisdom thank you so much for sharing with us you know, from, from the beginning all the way through your workflow and your projects on the horizon. Uh, like we said, uh, everybody can find you at lilyhayden.com, mm -hmm. L-I-L-I-H-A-Y-D-N.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, before we go, are there any final words of wisdom that you would, you know, uh, you know bestow upon a hopeful career musician of your stature? Um. I would just say, uh, remember the words of my mom, and I said it before, but just that the only thing that's fair is between you and the creation. Mm. Um, so just make it your religion. Make it your waking and sleeping, breathing, uh, you know, just make everything music. If it, it may already be that, and just know that this is for you. It's, you know, whatever happens, uh, enjoy the process, whatever happens. There's no achievement. I can tell you, you know, I, I, so I, I want a Grammy. That's like one of the, you know, things we aspire, we, we, we say we don't aspire to, it, but you know, it's a, it's a cool thing. Um, it really honestly didn't change my life that much. And the, if I were only focused on getting the Grammy and didn't, pay attention to, you know, and I wasn't, you know, in love with the process of making music, I would be miserable now because it, you know, uh, it didn't, re it didn't change my life. Mm. I mean, it, a little bit, but you know, it's, uh, and, and actually I, I used to live in Laurel Canyon and I remember uh, driving down the mountain. There's only one road down Laurel Canyon. Uh, so I remember, uh, and I guess, I can't remember what's her name. There was a, 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 this was probably about seven years ago. Um, no, maybe I guess 10 years ago, something like that. Uh, and I'm driving down the mountain and there's this big pop singer who I know lives down the street from me. So I'm following, her, I'm driving down the street after her. Uh, and she's, you know, and at the time she had a career that I would have loved to have had. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, you know, driving after, like behind her Mercedes and we're driving down, you know, Laurel Canyon, I'm kind of like, 
well, you know, and she's on the radio and la, 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 and I was like that career, I would like to, ha-, you know, I'd like yeah, that thing that happens, you know, are we driving down Sunset Boulevard and there's a giant billboard of the new next big thing on the billboard. And I watched her look at that billboard and have that and have her face drop. Um, and I, and I saw the same thing that I had just experienced down the mountain happened to her next in the car next to me. And I, it was just perfect Yes, because I, it was just a reminder that no achievement, no amount of success is, is worth it or gratifying or the, the answer unless you're enjoying the process. And I would just say as, you know, don't be afraid to have uh, another source of income if you have to. Mm. Uh, everybody I know has something, you know, I'm not making my living from doing gigs now. I'm making my living from scoring films now. Uh-huh. And the the money that I made at, for on my records, I invested and I, you know, uh, and I live off of, of a small, you know, like that, that helps buffer my, the, the ups and downs of my income, mm-hmm. you know, um, I just, whatever it takes, if you're really, if you're going to do it, fucking do it, do it all the way and enjoy it and revel in it. And just don't be afraid for, don't be, don't be, don't let it destroy you when you get rejected and don't let it, right. you know, knock you off your balance and your practice regime. When you get your awards, just give it all the love and, and that music and the pursuit of being uh, the best version of yourself is actually a metaphor for our spiritual evolution as well. It's all in there. Every time I practice, it's a meditation for me. Mm-hmm. And when I realize that my that the sound, my intonation, my tone, everything is improved when I actually give it the kind of love and mindfulness that I would if I were saying a prayer. Mm-hmm. Uh, or telling my dying mother that I love her, you know, or whatever it is that you do that means something to you. If you give it all of that love and attention and mindfulness, that everything will be better. Everything, uh, it, it's just, it, there's really no boundaries for me between my spiritual evolution and my musical evolution. So I say just, the richness is there. And one more quote by my mom, Lotus Weinstock. Uh, love is always there. It's just we who are not. Mm, that's great. So, uh, so <clears throat> you know, extrapolate that and make that your music technique. It's all, the beauty is always there. And dare to suck. Dare to, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and give yourself the time to, like, play, slow it down, slow down. Just make it your religion, and uh, and it and it will give, it will give back to you. That, okay, first of all, that was amazing. But I got to tell you, the quote of the career musician right now is, "If you're gonna do it, just fucking do it." <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Coming from Lily Hayden herself, I love it. Spoken like a true, tenacious career musician that you are with all of your accolades. Just Thank you. Brilliant. So, killer. <laughs> all right, before we wrap, some rapid-fire questions. You down with that? Sure, yeah. Okay, here we go. Song or band or artist that changed your life? My God. Uh, uh, wow. Uh, probably the Cocteau Twins, to be honest. Uh, 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 song, um, oh, I don't know. I think Bjork comes to mind, but I'm sure that that's not, you know, like maybe, maybe Led Zeppelin. Um, Great. Yeah. Okay. There's no rules here. There's no wrong answers. This is you, baby. This is all you. <clears throat> okay. All right. When you were on tour, when you used to do some tour dates, what are the three tour essentials you can't leave home without? Um, instant lentil soup. Oh, good one. Uh, good black leggings um, and earplugs. Good choices. What entertains you? As an entertainer, what entertains you? Anybody who's taking a risk and, tr- and doing something that I didn't expect. Something that um, I really like to be 
uh, I want to hear somebody really going through a, in a real authentic change. And I don't want to feel that it's calculated. Uh, I want it to feel really organic and even better if it's a, if it's a brain or like something that's a little idiosyncratic. Mm. So not for the sake of it, but that like, I, I love hearing, I love getting inside of brains that don't, don't work like mine. That's, that's a great answer too. Instrument you wish you played. Uh, I really, I wish I played cello, mm. uh, but uh, I can fake it a little bit, but I really wish I could play for real. I see one behind you as well. Next, yeah. next to the Grammy on the piano. That's awesome. Yeah. And the charango up in the corner, just like mine. We both have the same charango. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, your friends would say you are? Uh, um, today, I'd say they, they probably think I'm a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite city? I, just, I don't take no for an answer very easily. Um, hey. But they might, they'd also say that I'm very loyal. Um, and I'm I'm a good person to call uh, in the middle of the night. I actually like to say that I'm a foul weather friend. Foul weather, that's a... Yeah, you've, you've heard of a fair weather friend. But I'm a foul weather friend. I love that little clever take. Okay, hidden talents. Um, I make very good tea. And, uh, and I make uh, very good soup. Speaking of soup, guilty food pleasure. Guilty. Uh, uh, um, coconut ice cream. Oh, that's nice. And do you have a drink of choice, a libation, or? You know, I recently become allergic to spirits, um, but my favorite uh, is like I uh, can't remember the name of it, but it's that fabulous tequila that with the the one that you splurge on when you get your Grammy. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the one of the tall blue and white bottle, you know what oh, I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah. I think I know what you're talking about. It's not the Don Julio. It's not, ah, oh, geez. I know what you're talking about though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is it um, Azul maybe? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Azul. Yeah. There you I go. think it's Azul. Oh, anyway. Yeah. I, yeah. I love a good tequila, but, uh, um, right now it's just good red wine. I can do right, good red wine. All right. Now you've had a lot of amazing collaborations. Do you have a dream collaboration that hasn't happened yet? Well, my dream collaboration was with Prince, mm. sadly. Uh, but um, maybe in my dreams. Um, and uh, who I'd like to collaborate with now, um, man. Uh, and I would have said Ennio Morricone as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I would love to collaborate with Radiohead. Mm. Good one, good one, good one. And finally, actually, uh, you know what, Kendrick Lamar. Kendrick Lamar, I like that one too. Yeah, That's awesome. Yeah. All right, and finally, what would you do if you weren't a career musician? I would either be a brain surgeon or uh, a um, a human rights lawyer. Huh. Very cool answers. I like that. I man, uh, so 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 astounded with your whole concept from beginning to end. Really impressive, Lily. Thank you so much. I love how. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I love how you go so much deeper than the music, and you connect on on a humanity level, a humanitarian level, and and that's really impressive. So thank you for sharing. Well, thank you. And, and, and if I may just uh, speak to that, uh, I, I've probably gone on too long. No, it's okay. <laughs> but I just want to say, uh, you know, it's uh, I go deep because it's my everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when music is your really your life then you have to find your relationships in music. You find your love in music. You find your meaning of life in music. You find your sense of God and the divine and magic and nature and, uh, and humor and everything in music. And it's not to say that I don't have days where I don't play music, but I think I approach things musically. And so, uh, so you realize everything is everything you know, like that, that it's really music is a microcosm for anything, anything that you're looking for can be found, or there's some kind of parallel in music, I think. 
Um, so, uh, and music makes people feel their hearts. And when you can feel your heart, you're more likely to feel the heart of the person in front of you, which of course means, you know, if you, you take that to its extreme and then you have, then you're feeling the heart of the world that's of, of the universe. And so that's, it's, I don't really think about going, it going deep. I just look to find what's really there. Love it. Love it. Once again, Lily Hayden, everybody on The Career Musician. Thank you so much for having me. Good Have, luck, everybody. Yeah. And actually, one more thing. Luck is, my mom used to say, luck is just an acronym. An acronym labor under correct knowledge. I love that. Labor under correct not See, there you go. Bam. Love, filled with wonderful wisdom once again. <laughs>